Laura practiced dentistry for 10 years before realizing it wasn't a match for her and that she needed to quit. Now she helps dental professionals cure burnout by starting a successful and enjoyable side gig so they can reduce clinical practice hours and regain career happiness. Laura, by the way, is the first repeat guest on the podcast after her first episode last year received nearly 5,000 views. Welcome back to the podcast, Laura. Well, I'm so honored. Thank you for having me the first time and a second time, Matthew. Yeah, that's it's. Uh, and yeah, I'm inviting you back because I, I felt, A, I feel like this is such an important topic area that just isn't discussed enough. But also, I felt like we didn't get even, you know, very far below the surface of what we could talk about. So we'll see kind of uh, where we where we go with this today. But first, I would love it if you would just kind of for all the people who didn't see the first one, or maybe it'll come out a little differently this time, uh, just for you to describe the journey a little bit that led you through your clinical dentistry to the point of realizing it needed to be something different. Absolutely. So I, um, I actually liked dental school. Um, I thought that the real world of dentistry would be better. Mm. Um, and then I got into the real world of dentistry and I knew my first three years that it was going to be hard. So I, I, I allowed that for myself. I kind of built that into my process and, and was okay with all of the challenges that come in those first few years. And uh, about year three, it wasn't getting easier. And that hope of it getting easier for me, you know, and truly year three was kind of a marker of, you know, by around year three, around year five, it'll start to get so much easier. And it did get easier in some ways, but I still felt a lot of pain doing the work that I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that point, I would say that I kind of lost hope. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you realize how much hope can make us feel happy. <laughs> Right. Right. Like even yeah. if you're in the moment isn't so great. Like those first three years, I had the hope like this is my dream career. I just need to work through the hard stuff and I'll get there. And, right. and so it made it tolerable. But once I lost hope, yeah, it all flew out the window. Right. Yeah. Hopeless. I mean, that word hopeless. Right. And it's not even less hope. I mean, I guess it gets to be even worse than hopeless. It's hope lost. Is it? Yeah. That'd be the next word after a hopeless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's it's pretty um it's a pretty depressing word if you yeah. really stop and think about it. And yeah. and that was how I felt. I I got to a point where um I was completely burnt out. I didn't know it was burnout because no one was talking about burnout in 2004. Um, not really in any career. Right. Um, and I didn't think that someone could get burned out in their first three years of dentistry. I was too young to right. experience burnout. So um, that with that came a lot of anxiety, a lot of, I, I call it kind of a low grade depression yeah. where I was upbeat enough that I would hide it and I would cope with, oh, you know, this is, this is still a good career for me and I still like it, but, but inside I was feeling so much pain. Right. Um, so in year three was when I decided that I wanted to consider other options. And then I very quickly talked myself out of it. Mm. The economy wasn't going so great. I, I should all over myself and said, I should be lucky to have a job, right, right. right? I should be lucky to, you know, have a house, all these things when all these other people are struggling, which is definitely something that we do as right. dentists. Right. Um, and I just, I just convinced myself to stay for seven more years um, <laughs> and riding, I, I rode the roller coaster of, you know, for, for a few months it was okay. And then a few months it just, I went into the depths of worry and anxiety and, and sadness feeling like, I don't think I could do this my whole life. Yeah. Um, so it was a, a roller coaster for sure. And in year seven, I decided I really wanted to try to get out again. And then it took me three years. So wow. those last three years were painful. I mean, there were days I'd go in for to do an, an just an exam in a in a hygiene exam. And I would I remember looking down at this mouth and looking at the teeth and and as I'm examining and thinking, 
if I have to look at another tooth, mm. I don't know how I can do another day of this. Mm. So even though uh, in year seven, I decided it took me three years to actually leave and give myself that permission to, to move on. Yeah, that was a lot. I mean, you use the word pain several times there. And in my mind, I'm picturing, you know, it's like challenging journeys, like if somebody's climbing a mountain and that's their quest that I'm, I'm, I have this noble goal, uh, and there's an end result I'm going for. And when I get there, it'll all be worth it. And it may be arduous and painful at points along the way, but, but then I also think like, what's the purpose of pain? Pain tell, I mean, it's for, for dentists, right? Patients coming in. Well, now if it's to the point of pain already, then we are to a place of, we need, there's going to be some significant intervention that has to occur if you're already to that place, right? We we have damage now. There's damage occurring. So making me think, I mean, at three years, you were already feeling like this is painful and it didn't look like maybe it was going to get better. You know, and but you had a hard time accepting that, right? So how much pain do we bear? Like, when is it, when is the, the point where you just go, I don't, this doesn't make any sense. If I'm in this much pain that I need this, something's wrong, something's wrong. And I need to be, I need to, I need to address this. Right. I mean, when you hear me say that, I mean, what comes up for you? Oh, first of all, what comes up is I love how our, I love where our conversations just meander to. So what a great point. And, and as you mentioned, you know, climbing the mountain. I live in Colorado and I do some hiking and I have written blog posts about the pain of climbing up the mountain and how um, when you're in pain, you just might not see certain things. Um, For example, the wildflowers in the summer. Mm -hmm. And then, Mm -hmm. and then as I'm hiking down, I see all these flowers that I didn't see hiking up because I wasn't in pain, you know? And so I think when I think about pain, I think about, well, well, let's differentiate the types of pain. There's the pain of, all right, this is a good pain. This is an exercise pain. This is a, you know, I'm, 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 I'm doing this to achieve my goal and it's going to be a win. And then there's a pain of, I'm trying to hike up this mountain with a broken foot. Mm -hmm. Right. And that kind of pain is when we need to recognize that pain and get out right? and say, you know, there's no this will be worse for me if I continue hiking on this broken foot. And and pain um, can be, I think it's our greatest motivator, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's when, think about when people want to make change in their lives, what's driving them a lot of the time. It's something, it's a fire to put out. Yes. It's pain. Yes. Um, so, I, so I guess it's probably really important to differentiate really what the pain is means and what kind of pain it is yeah that's good that's a really good distinction and i had just made some notes as i was thinking where you know where would i kind of like to see us go in this conversation and i had written down kind of this process of awareness and self-honesty that were required for you. you had to you had to stay in paying attention right because i think a lot of times we try to blur stuff out and escape and we don't want to have to be aware i don't want to be aware of pain i mean it's just like way we take medication to cover pain sometimes rather than dealing with what the real issue is so if i have to remain aware of pain that's painful and then, but then to be honest with ourselves about what this is meaning, to look deeply enough to see what there's a message here. That's the gift of pain, right? Is the yeah. message. Yeah. Um, and I just actually had a phone call with a dentist who was telling me that um, he has gotten to a point after two years of really deliberating to realize that he, that, 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 he doesn't see himself doing this forever. Mm-hmm. And and what we talked about was that that first step is being real with yourself. Right. And 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 just being honest because we look, I think it's good to cope with challenges and and try and I right. did a lot to try and save my career. I went to the Pinky Institute four times. 
I switched jobs. Yeah, I never owned a practice, but that's a whole different topic. That's not for everyone, right? Right. Um, and I did a lot. I I do think it's important to okay. How can you test it and make sure that I'm doing everything I can so that I can feel confident, right? That this is what I want, and that then you can be real with yourself. Then you can give yourself permission. And when that pain keeps coming back after you try strategy after strategy, right. then maybe that's just your intuition trying to tell you something. Yes. Yeah. That's so good. And it makes me think it's like, I often use the image of like when I was at Niagara Falls and seeing the power of these falls coming down and thinking, I had this flash of what was, what, what does that have been like for people first coming upon those falls by coming down the river and seeing the falls from that perspective and it would be too late. Like how many people would have lost their lives before we'd mapped out that there was a Niagara Falls and got the word out, right? So if we knew that was there and people were kind of innocently, naively floating down the river, gradually picking up speed, then what would we do? If we had life preservers, we would want to run, be kind of almost be our ethical responsibility to run back up that river and start trying to alert people don't keep going. This is not likely to be good for you, right? And it will get to the point where it's like too late. To, to, and so I'm thinking about how that relates here and thinking, could we back it up further? I mean, what is it? what was it about you and your, your uh, strengths, your style, your life experience that could we have known sooner without you going through all of that? Is there... Is there a way to spare more people all of dental school to then end up going, this isn't really for me? I don't know. That's kind of comes up. I don't know what your thoughts are. I love that question too. Uh, I've thought about that a lot. And oftentimes I have dental students or, or students who are applying to dental school reach out to me. And those are the people who I probably am the least able to help mm. because how do you know until you experience life? Right. Right. And so we're looking for these answers and these clues the best we can, but there's no way of ever knowing in the, in anything in life. And the, the hard part about dentistry is that you can't ever really know what it's like until you've invested all the time and money and your whole identity in this education. And then you've got to spend more years in, in, in getting the practice in. Right. And so, you know, there, are, I think there are people who I went into dentistry with the highest of hopes. I mean, I thought this was going to be my dream career. And in fact, you know, dental school was pretty cool for me, even though there were challenges. Right. Um, and I, part of me feels like I, I people don't like it when I say that there's a little bit of luck involved. Hmm. Uh, but in a sense, we all show up knowing what we know about it and and which isn't the most accurate depiction of actually sitting in that chair and being a dentist, right? right? right. Half of us are going to get through and love it. And half of us are going to get through and, and not love it. Yeah. And that that's the part when I say that there's, there's going to be a little bit of luck involved in this. Right. Like we all have the best of intentions. Some of us could maybe know, you know, I've talked to students who they'll say, um, well, you know, I've realized I don't really like dentistry and I don't want to go be a dentist, but I know that if I, if I go through dental school, then I could do research. And I, I always say, if like, go to dental school, cause you want to do dentistry, right. don't go to dental school because you're going to find a random alternative and in, in it, because that's not easy. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's a good message for people to hear. Right. It's almost like instead of at that point, it's dentist, instead of dentist side gigs, it's dentist alternative gigs with better pathways to get there maybe at right th at point yeah and and maybe looking at what are your motivations right if you think oh i go to the dentist and all they do is check my teeth and they make all this good money and I, and they have this like easy cush life and i'm going to do it so i can and and there's nothing wrong with being motivated by the money that was part right. of my um, inspiration for doing it, as well as wanting to help people and enjoying teeth and smiles and the science right. of it, you know, it right. all right. fits in with it. Right. But if that's your sole motivation, like, oh, this is going to give me a fun, cushy, easy life, 
It's not that. Dentistry is the farthest thing from that. So if that's your motivation, maybe that's a red light. <laughs> yeah. And it's it, interesting to see what to if we could, and maybe the research has been done as to why, you know, where are people getting their information? Why were they influenced if they were to choose dentistry? I know a lot of times family has been involved in dentistry and that was a, a factor. Uh, but I think dentistry has often seemed like a great profession that mm -hmm. leads to success and stability and all of that. But I'm I'm imagining there's a lot of people who end up what their reasons were, were often not fully conscious and that the expectations then are not met because it's not exactly what they were, what they were thinking. But just to kind of go back to where we were. So the willingness to to risk change. I mean, you had so awareness, mm. self-honesty, um, but then you had to be become willing to risk the change to pursue a better life, right? I mean, it took you more years from when pain was evident. Um, so maybe what can you say about that, about that what brought you to the place of I need to risk it? Because there's a lot of people who would, I think, would say, that's my problem when I get to there. I don't know that I can risk trying to step out of this now. There goes, there comes the pain again. I, I was in so much pain. I just couldn't do it anymore. Mm. Um, and and that's where pain is a gift, right? Because it 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 forces us to move forward. It was also... Uh, my husband was a big um, factor in this and and I was creating pain for him mm. and I didn't even notice it. Yeah. I didn't know because I was so self-absorbed right. how hard it was for him to watch his wife come home every day from work, complaining every day. Mm. Like that's kind of hard to be around people who right. are down and negative. It's hard. So it really was affecting him. And finally he was like, you can't do this anymore. Sort mm. it out. And I don't care what we need to change. If we have to move, if we have to sell our house, mm. sort it out. Cause like our marriage isn't going to last right. if, yeah. if you were living your whole life this way. So that was, it was, I always joke, it was like an ultimatum, but it was so much permission. Right. And if I couldn't give, I see this a lot with Dennis is like, we can't give ourselves permission. Our partners are fully behind us and giving us permission. Not always, but some of the times. And we are the ones that just can't let go. And so I may I may I may even jump to your next question because we had about two minutes to talk and we talked about the word quitting. Mm, yes. Right? <laughs> yes. And so, you know, we don't want to quit because what does that say about us? Right, right. Um, so it's really letting go and maybe redefining what our lives can look like. Right. Yeah, I think I was thinking also just about the drive for freedom, right? I mean, because when you've got pain and you need to be delivered from that pain, there's a drive for freedom. But even if you weren't in that much pain, I mean, isn't that something that we as human beings kind of intrinsically want? We want to be free free to be joyful, free to pursue our dreams, free to to feel like we did great work and we felt rewarded by that. And we want to be free. I mean, and there's so many different levels of which that could be discussed, but that drive for freedom. And so I think that quitting is kind of underappreciated uh, mm. you know, to, to what you said there. To quit something, even if it's good, like, I think it's even, I mean, maybe it was easier in a sense for you to quit because you were miserable. And if you didn't quit, misery was unlikely to stop, right? But what, how many people are there maybe who they're okay, but this is our life, right? And time is passing. I've often told people that our lives are too short and too long to be miserable, but how about too short and too long even to live in tolerate mediocrity just being okay like how is your life it's okay how you how you know what do you think eh, yeah i feel fine right i mean but i don't have any enthusiasm so if we still have time i always we talked last time about or maybe it was not on our in our in our interview but 
separately about like, about reinvention. We kind of joked about the reinvention convention, um, <laughs> which I still have that in my head. Still, still, yeah. <laughs> but, but I think um, reinventing, which is quitting, we have to quit something to reinvent into something else. Why? Because there's hope for more freedom, more fulfillment. So, I mean, how do you, what do you think about any of that relative to your journey? And, and, and as you're working with career coaching clients, how is that process coming up? Yeah. Well, you've come, you, in that, in that section, there are three, I had to take notes because there are three <laughs> things you said that I wanted to respond to that are so good. Um, you know, I think that there's, for me, it was pain. That was my driver. There are plenty of people in the world or in dentistry who are driven to want more greatness, mm. right? Th that drive for freedom that you mentioned. And that's a great motivator for some people, but something happens. And I think, I think in our upbringing and our expectations and stuff where we, um, not all of us have that same intrinsic, um, vision. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the ones like me who were just so in pain, but I'm such proof that you can go from that person who's driven by pain to then be driven by wanting more greatness. Mm. We can change, right? We're not stuck the way we are. And then you talk about just tolerating good enough. I feel like that's kind of the middle point, right? It's the people driven for greatness, the people running from pain and the people just tolerating good enough. In right. a way, that's almost the worst. Yeah. Right. Because you're yeah. just on the fence. You're not doing anything. It's like shades of gray at best. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're just like <laughs> just just almost asleep at the wheel. Right. Mm. And and it's it's not a decision, really. It's it's you're just tolerating this thing that doesn't give you joy. But at least if you're driven by pain or greatness, at least you're driven. Right. So, although, I mean, we could go back and forth. People who are tolerating good enough, there are times where I think, wow, it it would have been great if I could have had a lifelong dental career where I just tolerated it and I lived my life for other things, but right, right. that's just not me, right? Right. I need to love what I do. And so right. do a lot of dentists. That's why we chose dentistry. We want to love our careers. Right. Um. So those are... The two things, but you want to go back to the word quitting or did you want to add yeah, any? Yeah, let's, I okay. mean, I, I'm thinking about that. So what, what more would you want to say about that? Um, about quitting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, people so often say to me things like, um, like if I say, oh yeah, I quit dentistry. And I, sometimes I like to say these words on purpose because it, yeah. it triggers people. Right, yeah. Um, it makes them feel bad. And some, sometimes it makes them feel sympathy for me. Mm, mm. Um, and I want to shake it up. Mm. And let's say that like quitting isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you're climbing that mountain and you're just out of breath and you quit, all right, we might say that you're, that's a bad thing. Cause you don't get to see the view from the top. Right. But if you're quitting because you have that broken foot, quitting is the best thing for you. And quitting may actually be like the most courageous thing you can do. So I like to kind of flip quitting on its head and yeah. just shout it from the rooftops and be like, yeah, I'm a quitter because it's harder to quit. It takes way more courage in this case, especially to quit than to stay. Yes. I love that. Especially when you've invested so much, maybe you still have debt when you're, when you're coming to these conclusions and you're in that much pain. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's much easier to stay. Yeah. It's much more inconvenient to, to face right. the truth. Yeah. And I think sometimes too, I, I love what you just said. And I think sometimes too, it's like purpose fits in there or calling. Like, I think we can endure more or stay at something in longer and keep seeking the way through to greater vibrancy and life in something that maybe isn't working well, we can still, we can make it better. We can find a way a lot of times to make things better. And I think we persist more when there is a, a sense of a calling or a real driving purpose. If that's lacking and we don't, we have a hard time 
tapping into that something that compelling. Now, when we face that level of pain or adversity, it, it, I think it's, then it's a giving up. And that's, there's a distinction, I think, between quitting and giving up. What what comes up for you or how would you describe that a difference between I'm giving up versus I'm quitting? Oh, I, I like that. I have not thought of that about that before, but what comes up for me in that is this idea that um, giving up is more apathy. Giving up is saying, you know what? There's no way I can ever win in life, in this game of life. So why bother trying? Yeah. I'm just going to not try. I'm going to just roll over, you know, whereas quitting almost, and at least the way I define it has more intention yes, or action to it. It's saying, I'm going to get rid of what's not working for me so I can get more of what I want. Yeah. I like that because I, I think that it is apathy. It is depression. Maybe it's to a point. It's a, a giving up is like I've gone too far and I can't even rally versus I think quitting being more intentional maybe is a response to the pain that is constructive that says I need to get back to joy and therefore I need to quit something to find my way back to joy versus the giving up i think i've already lost even i don't even know where joy was now right and and sometimes so often in life it's like we have to let go of things to create more space for things to come in yeah um so yeah i just think that too often we take a single word and we we put such meaning on it when and that's what keeps us stuck right all the judgment there yeah yeah. I think there's a lot of a lot <laughs> of applications to this. And I yeah. love conversations like this. I'm hoping that our viewers are enjoying this as well and sticking Me with too. it. So as we head towards wrapping up, I'd like you to share just a little bit more about dentist side gigs. Uh, you know, anything that you might want to share that we haven't really talked about in terms of your career coaching orientation maybe and as that relates to dentist side gigs options alternatives absolutely so when it comes to i love a side gig because it is the most realistic vehicle for someone who wants career change um and because we've invested so much in our careers that we're not going to jump off the career cliff right, right? Right. Like we need that safety. We need that time to process. So I love a side gig because it, and dentistry is perfect for it because you can work a few days in dentistry and still do well. Right. Mm -hmm. So I love it as a vehicle of, of really creating more freedom, more space for yourself. You can build that up and then give yourself permission to phase down the dentistry and just do it in a really safe way. Um, so that's why I'm a fan is that of, mm -hmm. of that as the vehicle, mm -hmm. What I find is that people aren't looking inward. Mm. They're looking externally for the answers. Mm. They're looking for um, what jobs are out there. Right. What do you know that I can do? What are typical things that dentists can do? And and they're they're never really looking at what is actually keeping me stuck in dentistry. Because right. half the time there are opportunities everywhere. Right. We just don't either see them or allow ourselves to see them or none of them sound good enough. Right. And that's because there's something missing inside right. that I think as dentists, we settle into this identity. We got a lot of kudos for it when we chose dentistry, when we were younger, we were kids, we were, you know, half of us were 18, 19, 20 saying, I'm going to go to dental school. And we never really knew ourselves because that's what life is for. Right. Right. And so we, we almost shut down, shut down, maybe even into that world of good enough, mm -hmm. of just tolerating. We shut down. We don't see who we are. We don't know what we like. We don't know what's important to us. We don't even believe after a while that we can design the life however we want. So I'm a big fan of doing the work from the inside out and really getting to know yourself, working on your rules. Like we all have rules that we create for our, how we need to live our lives 
And if we can look at our rules and write the new rules and, and recognize like there are some rules that I have created for myself just from learning from my influences that right. don't serve me. Right. Why can't I rewrite them? It's my life, right? right? So it's really about like, you know, looking at your beliefs and your rules, reconnecting with who you are. And then we can start to look at, okay, what's out there? Right, right. Yeah. And then, you know, Matthew, what's really, one more thing I'll add is mm -hmm. when we start looking at different side gig ideas, the, the problem I see a lot of people have is um, they get an idea, they get excited about it, and then real life kicks in and whatever happens, they decide that like they're scared of it or they don't believe they could do it or it's going to be too much work. Right. They're looking at it as like this big task instead of breaking it down into small, doable, manageable pieces. Right. And um, this is just one of those processes that I have found takes daily commitment, small steps. There's a book I love called The Slight Edge. I don't know if you've ever read it. I love that book. By, by Jeff Olson. And I, I love it because it talks about how change really happens. Mm. And change really happens by showing up every day consistently and taking small steps. There's It doesn't happen in big quantum leaps. And so I think people miss mm. that principle and then they just talk themselves out of it and, and give up. Right. Yeah. Maybe they get impatient in that, like the process looks too big and therefore I don't know if I have the patience to walk it a step at a time or... I'm also curious if you have found this reinvention um, to be easier, harder for people, whether they're in their 20s, 30s, and I'm not sure what the percentage, what the age breakdown is for people you're working with in general, um, by the time they're looking for help. Um, but does it get easier because I'm... I'm, I need to have more life and I see the clock ticking or is it harder as people get older because maybe we become a little bit more risk averse or don't feel like we have the energy for change or what would you say? I would say that it's the same. Okay. Because people who are single always say it's harder for them because they're not married. People who are married always say it's harder for them because... Uh. They're not, you know, they, they're not free to do whatever they want and single, right. right? People who are young, it's harder because they don't have as much saved people who are older. It's harder because they're more settled in. I will say the only people who I do think it genuinely is harder for is when you have children, mm. because that takes so much more time. You, it doesn't mean it's not doable, right. um, but being someone who does not have children, I can imagine that mm. if you have kids that you have to be responsible for right. on a daily basis with the tasks and in the big picture, right. I think that would make it harder than for someone like me who doesn't have to worry about little kids running around. Yeah. That, I, I think that might be the only exception I would make. But other than that, everybody else thinks it's harder for them. Right, right. That makes sense. <laughs> Well, this has been, from my perspective, another fascinating conversation. I love your thoughts about all this. I love that you're doing this. I think this is such a necessary challenge to the way people think. I think I loved your your guidance to redirect back inside to find what's inside rather than just looking for external options without considering, you know, what's in me to want to do or where my life be invigorated again for me. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm again thinking there'll be people who will want to reach out to you to get input. Maybe you can tell about Dentist Side Gigs Facebook group and then also how people can reach you if they want to have a conversation. Yes, well, thank you so much. I These are my favorite conversations. You always bring out the the best in me and the best topics. So thank you for having me again, Matthew. We should just kind of call each other up and then turn on Zoom and record and just right, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great conversations. <laughs> but yes, um, I do have a Facebook group. It's called Dentist Side Gigs. Um, it's a great community to really allow people to see that there is another way in dentistry. That's my mission. Um, my website is Lola B's Career Coaching. 
uh, com. You can do that or do a search for, I wrote a post years ago titled 10 reasons your dentist probably hates you too. That went viral. So that's an easy Google. You can find my website that way, or I'm on Instagram at um, Dr. Lullabies. So Dr. Lullabies, Dr. Lullabies. I'm happy to have a chat with anybody. Okay, awesome. And Lullabies is L O L A B S B E E S. Like right. bumblebees. That's right. Okay, that's awesome. Well, I so appreciate you. Appreciate the friendship that we've developed, and I, I love these conversations as well. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I'm honored. Thanks so much, Matthew. Absolutely. So this is Matthew Norton. This is the Truth Behind Dentistry podcast. We've been with Dr. Laura Brenner of Lola B's Career Coaching, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you.